Good morning. Happy Sabbath, everyone. It's good to be in church this morning, although it's pretty nice outside, too. So I encourage everyone to, uh, to get outside this afternoon, get out for that hike or go down to the beach or wh- whatever, whatever you do on a sunny day. So it's going to be a great weekend. I'd just like to welcome everyone here this morning. Um, and uh, anyone that is joining us online, whether it's uh, by YouTube or Facebook, we welcome you as well. And uh, I'm sure that the Lord has a blessing for each and every one of us this morning. So I've just got a reading. Um, last time I was up here, um, I also read from the Beatitudes. So from Mount, uh, um, thoughts, from Mount of, uh, thoughts from the Mount of Blessings. My, my, my mouth's not working today. Uh, blessed, uh, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. You find that in Matthew 5, 4. The morning here brought, the morning here brought to view is true heart sorrow for sin. Jesus says, I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. And that's in John 12, 32. And as one is drawn to behold Jesus uplifted on the cross, he discerns the sinfulness of humanity. He sees that, that it is sin which scourged and crucified the Lord of glory. He sees that while he has been loved with unspeakable tenderness, his life has been a continual scene of ingratitude and rebellion. He has forsaken his best friend, Jesus, and abused heaven's most precious gift. He has crucified to himself the Son of God afresh and pierced anew the bleeding and stricken heart. He is separated from God by a gulf of sin that is broad and black and deep, and he mourns in brokenness of heart. Such mourning shall be comforted. God reveals to us our guilt that we may flee to Christ and through him be set free from the bondage of sin and rejoice in the liberty of the sons of God. In true contrition, we may come to the foot of the cross and there leave our burdens. Amen? Amen. A few announcements this morning. Um, Caleb has an announcement. I think I'm going to bring him up first. And let you know that tomorrow we are actually having a whitewater rafting trip in Port Alberni. Um, If you're interested in coming, uh, please do. We only have roughly four to five rafts, so we can only fit maybe 20 to 24 people (coughs) in the boats. Other than that, if you just want to come and hang out, you're welcome to do that as well. Um, We will be uh, arriving at uh, 4540 Wellington Avenue in Port Alberni at 10 o'clock. That is the meeting time for uh, the, the staging, and then we're going to go to the river uh, for rafting. We're going to do a safety briefing, and we're going to get in the water and uh, have a good day. So if you guys want to come, please do. i um, looking forward to seeing some of you there. Thank you, Caleb. All right, so we've got a few announcements. Um, First one is um, to do with the fellowship meal. Now, on the screen there, it says next fellowship meal. Um, We're going to get rid of the word next. So we're going to have a fellowship meal on July 9th at Westwood Lake. Um, And no, it's going to be July 9th. We've we've changed it. (laughs) Sorry. Um, Yeah, so we changed it. Um, And it will be a solid theme. Um, but there will be a potluck on July 2nd as well, but we're going to do that here, and we're going to do, are we still good? We're going to do a Ukrainian theme, okay? So, um, so yeah, a little bit of a change up, um, and the reason for that, just so you know, um, we were going to do the Westward Lake on July 2nd, but it's the long weekend, and it's going to be packed there, 
Um, and we're just not sure whether we're going to get enough space and parking and all of those things. So we just flipped it. We flipped the Westwood Lake to July 9th, and we'll do this to a, a regular potluck here um, with the Ukrainian theme. So we look forward to that. All right. Daniel and Revelation Bible Studies. Um, we're going through a series, a video series, called Salvation and Symbols and Signs. We're going to be uh, part five this Wednesday. I really encourage you to come on out. I'm serious. If you, if you ever wanted to truly understand the book of Revelation, like truly, um, this is where you need to be. And it's going to go on for a long time. We're probably going to be here for two years going through this series. There's well over 100 episodes. Um, and they're only 27 minutes long. We come at 7 o'clock. We'll start bang on 7 o'clock. Um, we'll watch the video. And then we just have a, maybe a half-hour discussion afterwards. Okay, and if the pastor's here, it goes on a little longer, but you know what he's like. Just one more thing, right? So, um, but yeah, I, I really do encourage you to come out. Everybody that's been coming out um, is receiving a blessing. And like I said, in these end times, we need to know what God is telling us through the book of Revelation. And so come on out. Um, it's a small part of, t of your time to give up um, for a very, very important message. So I do encourage you to come on out Wednesdays at 7 o'clock. The ABC Bookmobile um, for the delivery will be for here will be at 11 a.m. July 6th. Okay, um, the order deadline is July 29th or June 29th. So keep that in mind. Okay, if you don't order something, there's no sense coming because there won't be anything here for you. Okay, so make sure if you want something from the Bookmobile that you um, order June 29th, and then you'll be picking that up on July 6th at 11 a.m. Um, BC Camp Meeting is online, um, so virtual, and that'll take place uh, July 27th through 30th. We do have some uh, church business to take care of. We've got some membership transfers, one transferring out and one transferring in. And so we'll have a second reading on this next week and a vote, but for right now, we just want to announce that uh, there'll be a membership transfer. Taylor Tonin is transferring from the Nanaimo Church to the Medicine Hat Church. Okay, and then we also have a membership transfer. Hilda Friesen is transferring from the Forest Lake, Florida church to the Nanaimo church. Okay, so again, next week we'll have a second reading and a vote on those membership transfers. For, um, we'll be taking up an offering as we do each week, uh, but for those of you that would prefer to give online, if you just go to adventistgiving.ca and just enter your church name and just follow through on the process and uh, you we are also doing e-transfers so if you um, you can do that you can send it to e-transfer at nanaimoadventist.ca and uh, that'll get looked after and in the notes just put where you want it to go okay um, we have one more thing um, each week we give out a fruit basket and uh, this fruit basket um, the members of the Sabbath school bring a piece of fruit, and we give it to somebody that uh, we've been thinking about, maybe someone we want to show that our appreciation for. And there's been somebody missing from our congregation for a little while. And so we're going to give that fruit basket to Marlene. Welcome back, Marlene. It's good to have you back. Yeah. All right. Excellent. Now, I think that's all the announcements I had, so I'm going to invite Elia to come on up and have our children's story. I'm just a big kid at heart. So. <laughs> All right. Just wish I had it right here. Or I did. Good morning, everybody. Um, not a ton of kids here today, just nine, but uh, the entire internet, possibly, <laughs> depending on who's watching. So, um, and the big kids, of course, yeah. <laughs> so today we're going to read about um, Job from one of our favorite books. It's called Bible Heroes and Bad Guys. Um, so Job uh, gives us it gives us a summary of Job's life. He was always faithful to God. Um, he became Satan's target. At, and then he lost everything except his wife and a few friends. But um, he wouldn't give up his faith in God, and um, he got more than he ever had before. So 
um, Job was a great guy. Everybody loved Job, and why not? He had everything. One day, Satan was arguing with God about Job. Satan said something like, Job is a goody-goody because you give him everything he needs or wants. If you take away Job's good life, he'll turn away from God. God said, fine, test your theory. Pull the rug out, and I'm telling you, you're wrong. So su suddenly, Job's good life went down the drain. Job's servants were with his oxen and donkey when raiders attacked. Um, only one servant survived to report. Then, while he was listening to that report, another servant staggered in. All of his shepherds and sheep had been fried by lightning. Then a third messenger collapsed in front of Job, moaning that more marauders had um, murdered more servants and made off with his camels. Then a fourth servant rushed through the door to tell Job that all his children had been killed and their brother's house collapsed in a windstorm. What a nightmare. Job felt like he'd been punched in the guts. What did he do? He prayed and praised God, and God was pleased with Job's response. But it gets worse. Then Satan said, but he still has his health. Fine, devil, do the worst, God answered. Suddenly, Job was plastered head to toe by disgusting, bad-smelling sores. The poor guy used a broken piece of pottery to scrape pus from his boils. Job was a wreck. His wife told him to curse God, then lie down and die. But not Job. Not once did he swerve from loving God. Some of Job's helpful friends told him that he must have sinned and God was punishing him. But Job knew that wasn't true. He decided to talk to God and find out why this was all happening. God's answer was simple. Basically, God explained that he had his reasons for everything and told Job to have faith. And it was all right and good, even if he couldn't understand why. Job, you can't understand the reasons why I do things. Just hang in there. Sure enough, Job kept his faith in his great God. And in the end, Satan was proven wrong. No matter what he did, he couldn't dent Job's relationship with God. After a while, God gave him twice as much as he had before. So um, then it gives us a Bible supercharge from Psalms 23, chapter 4, uh, verse 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Okay. Good morning, church. Uh, let's stand up and think. We got it together.
Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name and make, his, make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing psalms to him. Talk of all his wondrous works, glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those rejoice who seek the Lord. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face forevermore. Amen. Yeah. 
garden of prayer and as many as can you can join me on your knees as we pray almighty and everlasting father in heaven thank you so much for a beautiful day like this thank you for the gifts of the sabbath thank you for taking us through the week in all of our activities you were with us and we are grateful for the numerous blessings you have bestowed upon us and our families. We thank you as a church for all that you continue to do for us. And today, being a day like this, we want to appreciate all you, you do for us. We feel blessed to call you our Father. More so that, Father, you care for us. And we know everything we have in our hearts, Father, you care, and at your own time, you will do and answer our heart desires. 
in a special way we pray and ask that you will have mercy on us. As sinful beings born into a world full of sin, by default we sin and we ask that you have mercy on us. Please forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That as you have promised, you will make us white as snow. That Father, today our prayer will be acceptable in your sight. In a special way, as a church, we bring before you these families. Joe Hall, Ellen Hack, Beulah Harriet, Darren, Adeline Hill, and family. It's our prayer that you visit them today. And whatever they ask, Father, is our prayer you answer them and bless them as you have promised. Be with us as a church and continue to lead and guide us. Deliver us from evil and lead us not into temptation. And Father, like our blessed hope is, is to see you soon and have eternity with you. As we prepare to listen to the word you have for us, we pray that Father, you prepare our hearts for your word, that your word will not come void, but fill us and give us strength and hope for the coming week. Be with us and continue to bless us, even now and forevermore. This and many other blessings we've asked through your son, Jesus Christ, have we prayed with thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. It's now time for our, where we take up our God's tithes and our offerings. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Matthew 6, 20 and 21. We worship God using our resources because it is the most secure placement the Bible reveals that in the end, the elements will destroy by fire, and the earth, everything done in it will be laid bare, Second Peter 3.10. Possession will be of no value. These events will represent the most severe recession, hyperinflation, depression ever experienced by humanity. Peter invites his readers not to take these things lightly, but to undergo some fundamental changes. What kind of people ought you be? You ought to live holy and godly lives, 2 Peter 3.11. We can learn something from those who had to cope with hyperinflation. In the time of inflation, prices could double in less than 24 hours. In some places, individuals would go to the grocery store carrying cash <coughs> in a basket over their heads. Worried and hungry people would line up for hours in front of banks to withdraw their savings only to hear the request denied. As a result, the population and investors would lose faith in the local currency. Many would try to exchange their money into stronger currency as a survival strategy. Some countries would exchange their devalued currency for new currency or start using foreign currency locally. Exchange is the key strategy. This corresponds with the admonition of Jesus, store up for yourself treasures in heaven. How can one do this exchange effectively? No need to go through the black market. To do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. This is the path revealed by the Apostle Paul, 1 Timothy 6.18. This week, as we worship with our tithes and regular offerings, we have another opportunity to exchange our perishable resources by being a blessing to others. At this time, I'm going to ask the deacons to come forward to collect God's tithes in our offerings.
Let us pray. Lord, you are so thoughtful that you care for both our present and our future. We thank you in advance. Please help us to be doers of your instructions. We just ask that you take these tithes and these offerings, Father, and bless them to the intended use, which is to win souls for, for heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Happy Sabbath. Our scripture reading for today comes from Isaiah 30, uh, verse 21. Your ears shall hear a word behind you, saying, This is the way, walk in it. Whenever you turn to the right hand, or whenever you turn to the left. May God bless the reading of his word. Amen. Is that better? Yeah. The funny thing is, when I'm at home watching it, I'm going, put the microphone on because I can't hear you. Yeah. But I did this last week in Port Alberni. But for some reason, I'm really, really nervous today, so excuse me. Uh, I didn't seem to be so nervous last week. But before I start, I'd just like to have a little prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this privilege of being in this Nanaimo church, which for many years I've been a member. Love this church, Lord. I love the people in it. I thank you, Lord, that this church has been part of my journey to where I am today. It's been a guiding light to me, as so is your word. So, Lord, may it be you that speaks this morning through your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. First of all, um, going back a few weeks ago, we had camp meeting. And some of you may have heard, I made a plea on behalf of uh, tithes and offerings and in that plea, we were, I was saying that we are planning something very, very special. I can report to you today that things are looking so, so good. Some of you many years ago would have heard of Adam Ramden, who spoke at our camp meeting several years ago and also he did a week of evangelism here. Oh, and by the way, I've just heard that Adam and Ike have another baby. It was on Facebook today. Um, but there was another thing that's happening too. And we're almost certain, we're hoping, possibly, we'll be having a visit at the camp meeting with Fountain View. And I think you're all very familiar with Fountain View. It'll be a blessing. I spoke this week to James Cleveland, who's a musical coordinator there, and uh, they can't wait. They pack in their bags. They can't wait to come to camp meeting next year. Another good thing, another possibility too, James informed me that while they're on the island, they're going to be doing some filming. They want to use his trip 
to do some of their wonderful filming of their concerts and so forth. So if, by possible chance, we can get Adam to continue after camp meeting to be here for a week of evangelism, the first two, maybe three days, Fountain View are quite willing to join us. And I think that is something so exciting and something we should all look forward to. And uh, if you remember, um, if you don't really know much about Adam Ramden, for a long, long time, we put on his lineage series, which was absolutely amazing and well done. He's a wonderful man. Okay, away I go. When I was a kid, I had heroes. When I was little, they weren't really heroes, but as a child they were. In fact, at a very young age, I even thought Superman was real. I really did. Young fellow. As I got older, my heroes, people I looked up to, unfortunately, were more like football players and so forth. The baseball players that were heroes of the game. I've had heroes in my life. I've had a couple of people that actually saved my life. As I look back, there were heroes in my life that introduced me to God. One in particular when I was a young man who was a very, fur an older man, I should say. And I was a very young fellow, just about reaching my teens. And I met this guy, and he was a, an uncle to a very poor family in my hometown street. And he was the very first man that told me of Jesus Christ as a savior. Didn't get into creation, but up till then, Jesus Christ was something that we mentioned at school in our assembly. But that was the very first time, now, a savior. Looking back, maybe not a hero, but a, a way mark, a beacon in my life that I can look back at. I've had a couple of people, and I've told the story before, two people that have miraculously saved me from drowning. So physically, I owe them as heroes for me being here today. A hero of mine, I've said it before, is the very first Seventh-day Adventist pastor that knocked on my door. But I want to talk to you about real heroes. We go back to the 13th and the 14th century, and we, 15th century, and we think of Luther, Wick, Wycliffe, Tyndale, wonderful, wonderful men of God that changed, changed everything in Christianity. And as we go further on, I had a, other heroes too. I can't get enough of reading about Seventh-day Adventist history. Something, sadly, most of our, I'm not going to say most, a lot of our young people right now don't know of the rich history of this church. I love reading about Uriah Smith, Mrs. White. I love to read it. The book, I've read it several times, A Flame for the Lord, John Andrews. These were real heroes in my life. I always will be. One person who was not a Christian that I know of, that I studied and followed all my life, was that wonderful cartographer, chart maker, and captain, was Captain Cook. I had so much admiration for that man. And over the years, 
I've tried to visit almost every place that that man has been, from his birthplace in Yorkshire to his brutal death in Hawaii. I wanted to go everywhere, ticking them off one by one. From Botany Bay to even just up the island here at uh, Friendly Cove. He did so much in cartography that his charts, today if you look with very rudimentary, equi rudimentary equipment, he made charts of Newfoundland that if you put today's satellite chart up, it's identical. He was an amazing man, what he did. And I've watched movies about him over and over again, just for what he did in that particular thing in life. On the time, at the time of his death on that beach in Hawaii, there was two other men. One was George Vancouver. A lot of people don't realize this, but George Vancouver was on that beach the day he died. And he, he ran back onto the boat and back to the ship. And of course, Vancouver is how we get the name of our island and Vancouver, the city across the water. But also on there, on that beach at the same time, was the infamous Captain Bly, who had learned so much. He learned so much that when we hear of the famous mutiny, he had learned so much from that great teacher. He was cast out on a small boat with 18 men with just basic navigational equipment. Because he, what he learned he was able to navigate 3,400 nautical miles. To us landlubbers, that's 4,000 miles. And to the recent days, that's 6,400 kilometers on an open boat with 18 men. He lost one man on the way. When they called on an island in Fiji and the natives didn't like them being there, and one was killed. I became a sailor years ago, and I loved it. I took to sailing like a duck to water. I became very competent at it, and uh, my goal, my dream, was to sail down to Hawaii or South Pacific. But my wife, Jean, said to me, I think your new wife might like that. <laughs> of course, it never happened. But we did a lot of sailing. And I studied charts. You see, I'm trying to compare our life today by being safe upon the waters around us. When we sail, when we're on a boat, I want to compare having the knowledge to do that in our journey with Christ. Because sometimes we put ourselves in terrible waters. We put ourselves in danger. The, there were times when I have walked away. Not, not, I have never ever walked away from God since I first learned of his incredible love, salvation, the cross, and of course, in later life, I've learned about the sanctuary. And my faith has got bigger, stronger as I've gone along. But there were times that I went into dark waters, places I shouldn't be, where the temptation was taking me away from God's word. And it was always in that time when I was not praying, 
not studying, not doing any Bible studies. Any, I became selfish. I walked away. And it, it happened in such a slow, very slow increments, like getting up in the morning, having prayer. That stopped. But I always said to myself, Mike, get in your truck. Don't even, don't even turn that radio until you talk to the Lord God your Savior. And that worked for a while. But then that stopped. And I started going into journeys, into waters that were deathly. I've done that on my boat. I've done things. I've made mistakes. Even though I knew I shouldn't have. And there was one particular time when I was taking a trip on my sailboat up to Powell River. Mistimed it. It became dark. Gene doesn't like being out in the dark on the water. I don't care. I've got my skills. I know where I'm going. I'm going to the Beach Gardens Resort in Powell River. I know the entrance. I know the rock. I knew everything to get there. But against my better judgment, I decided, as Gene pleaded with me to go to this harbor on the mainland, up by seashelf somewhere, where I knew there were rocks around there, and it was awkward to get in there. And again, against my better judgment, I took that risk, and it was dark, and I slid into that harbor with bated breath. I'm waiting to hear that crunch. Most stupid thing I ever did. And of course, when I got in there, the, the dock was full. So I had to turn around and just outside of the docks, I had to cast down an anchor. I had even got a chart for that. Something I would never do in the future, it's like when there's a challenge in front of you, you read your Bible. You look for guidance. I went into that stupid mistake. I had to lie there all night long. I cast the anchor. And I had to hold on to it all night long because I had, you see, when you look at a chart, It'll tell you where it's safe to put down your anchor. It'll tell you if it's silt, sand, it'll clay, or rocks. All night long, I was so scared. And I held on to the rope with my hand and slept outside. It was so cold, my mustache froze. But praise God, we got out of it. And it's something I would never do again. And the same in my spiritual life, I will not go into these dark waters. I will not start the day with talking to my Lord or, or at least spending a half an hour in his word. When the pastor asked me to preach, first of all, at Port Alberni, I cringe. I get this overwhelming sense that I'm unworthy, I'm a sinner. So I, I said to myself, why are you feeling that? Is it justified? And I thought it was, because I wasn't reading his word as much or as faithfully as I should. My prayers were somewhat hollow. And I praise God for this church throughout the world because we have Sabbath school lessons. We always read that, most mornings, Gina and myself, and our prayer time. And at the very end, on Fridays, there's always absolutely beautiful quotes from the Spirit of Prophecy. Friday's lesson, and it is always so encouraging. And I learned in the, those, those weeks gone by, this is my problem. I am wandering around, 
without the guidance of a chart, the Bible, or with God's blessing. I was doing that over and over again. And it's an amazing thing because it, just by reading my Sabbath school lessons, it has pulled me through so many problems in the last several weeks. There's, we all like to think ourselves as a beacon of light to other people. We want people to regard us as nice people. A couple of years ago, one of my neighbors said, Mike, when my kids are here, they know when I'm up at Salmon Beach, if there's a storm, a, a rainstorm or a windstorm, I get up the next morning and I go around everywhere and I'm looking for damage on people's homes. People know that I do that and they, they like me for it. And she said to me, I've told my kids, their teenage kids, when they're up here on their own, if anything goes wrong, she said, Mike and Gene are up in that cabin. And I thought, wow, that really pleased me. And I'm not patting myself on the shoulders because what I was thinking is that there's one person at Salmon Beach that I was not a beacon. He hated me for some strange circumstances. I thought to myself, why does he hate me? We'd, we'd, we'd had a conflict, and I did not handle it right. I read on the Friday, one Friday, and it was Mrs. White talking about forgiveness, being a good example. That morning I went out, I had to go up down by the river to pick up some stuff. And on the way back, there's this fellow at the gates, and I did not want to look him in the eye. In fact, for the last couple of years, I've not looked him in the eye. God's word was still getting at me, getting at me. So I thought, I can't go past this man. I've just read that in the spirit of, I've got to do something. I've got to be a beacon to people up there, not to the ones that I like. For in these writings by Mrs. White, that even the ones that despise you. So praise God. I smile at him and I said, good morning. I'll call him Dave. It's not his real name. Then I had to go up and see another fellow further into Salmon Beach. And as I came back, he came running at me, coming up to me. It's the same guy. And he said, Mike, I've got to come and pump out your tank soon. Can I do it on Friday? I did not want to talk to him. But the good Lord, his Holy Spirit, said, put out your hand. And I said, Dave, I said, let's start all over again. And he said, right now, Mike, from this day. You see, if we're not in touch with God's word, you are sailing on terrible, terrible oceans that are full of rocks and reefs, bad tides. The Bible is a chart for your spiritual life. You take a compass. You see, we trust the Bible. I have several things in the last few weeks. I have had to really be on my knees and pray. And he's coming through every time, one after another, one after another. Bring it to him in prayer. Why I call this God is a compass? Because if it's what God says, if it's what the Bible says, it is true. And a compass is true. Several years ago, I had got to take my power boat again up to Powell River. It was August, prone to a lot of fog. I went there the day before down to Schooner Cove where I kept 
I kept my, my sailboat down there, but I was, I was going to take my powerboat. And I thought, I'll go down there on a clear day, and I'll go, and I got my compass. And don't quote me, but I said 90 degrees. And I thought, if I go 90 degrees at this speed, even if it's foggy, I'm going to miss the southern end of Texador Island. And I can turn north up to Powell River, up the Malaspina Strait, it's nice and wide, and just hope from the best. 90 degrees. Sure enough, the next day I got up, it's foggy. And I got down to the ramp at Schooner Cove and I looked and it's swirling around Texada. And I went, this can't be right. Because through the fog, I said, that's got to be the south. If I go 90 degrees, I'm going to end up in Horseshoe Bay, miles off course. I argued with myself. I argued with myself. And I said, no, trust your compass. Sure enough, I got on my boat, trusted my compass, and it, it, it broke up just for a moment. And I could see I was going in the right direction, but as I looked further that way, what I thought was the south tip of Texada Island was a cove, a little channel that goes through there. It's full of rock. Trust in a God like you trust in a compass. There are times when think, things happen in our lives and we know what God is saying. We know what is right. But situation ethics, we try to argue with God's word. And we fall short. What God says is the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth. I'm completely lost right now because I'm rambling on. And um, I remember years ago, and this is what we like when we do not read our Bible, if we do not study, we can become lost. I was on a flight to Honolulu And I got my two youngest children with me, and Jean, of course. And an, an announcement came up, and I had got a seat that had won a prize. Wow. They come up, and they said, this is what you've got. And it was so many thousands of miles to fly with this airline. But they also gave the opportunity to my son and my myself to sit up front in the cabin, which you'd never do these days. And we sat there, and of course my son is like, all these instruments, I'm looking straight away. Navigation, that's what I love. Everything is blank, pretty well turned off. And the navigator said to me, he said, we're in a spot, it must, I think it's different now, in this next hour, hour and a half, you, we are in dead space. He said, we can't get anything in the navigation to work. We never can. It's a dead space and no radio contact. We had to go through there, but we don't have to go through any day at all when we're not seeking God's guidance and reading his word. The journey we have started, some have only just started maybe today. There might be people watching this on TV today. Their journey might be starting today in the journey to the cross, salvation. I've been on it for many, many years, and I've gone off course so many times, over and over again. But praise God, over the last little while, I have learned the benefits of reading God's Word and also the enjoyment of it, the enjoyment of reading. 
all about his wonderful promises. The the view that I have outside my cabin overlooks an absolutely magnificent, beautiful view. Tranquil waters, the Barclay Sound. It looks so good, like many things look good in our life, but Barclay Sound is dangerous. It's called the graveyard of the Pacific. It has taken out hundreds of boats, including, I do believe, a Royal Navy schooner. It looks so good. And, it, and some of the things that we see in life, when we wander off course and we pursue it, dangerous waters, as nice as it looks. Read your charts. Read each day your Bible. I have watched people out there And it reminds me of someone I've studied with for a long, long time. That they have no understanding as much as I, I have studied. His mind is going off all the time in dangerous waters. Dabbles in things he shouldn't. The... Years and years ago, there was a rock. Has anybody heard of Ripple Rock? A couple of people. Up in Port Alberni, nobody ever heard of it. But Ripple Rock was a rock in Seymour Narrows, just outside of Campbell River. Seymour Narrows. It was about four feet at low tide under the water. It was known to have taken out a hundred boats at least and 20 very large boats. And we know that he's taken 124 lives. And many, many years ago, they decided to go underneath, dig underneath. Well, it was dynamite and they blew it. It was, blew it up and it was the largest non-nuclear explosion. They were expecting a tsunami. That rock that was just below the surface was some of the, it's like the, some of the things in my heart that needed to be got rid of. My ripple rock, I'm not going to share what they, uh, what they are, but I thank God that he's, he helped me to get rid of it. Gone. But it's a struggle. Again, when you're out... And as we, as we are Christians, as we look out for the welfare of other people in our church, I can see many empty seats today. It's been like that for a while. But most experienced people out in the water, they have, a, they have their marine radio, two very important channels, Channel 16, universally in North America. That is... Straight to the Coast Guard. You, you listen to that, not for your own, just for your own safety, but you are asked to listen to it all the time. And if you hear a mayday, a mayday, if you are in that vicinity, it is your duty and legally to be looking out for these people. If you're 20 miles away, that's too bad. You can't help that. But if you know where they are, you are legally and morally, I suppose, to be out there looking for them. A lot of people over the years, I've had phone calls with those May days, and I could not ignore it. They have another one, which is Pan Pan. When they call Pan Pan, it means they're in trouble but it's not life-threatening. There are people missing here today, a lot of them, obviously, 
Is that their pan pan message? Do they want you to call them, check in on them? The other channel that we keep open is a weather channel. It will it continually all day long weather forecast. It never stops, never stops. It'll warn of a hurricane. And I don't know if you've ever been in a hurricane, but I have. And it is not a nice situation. I've been in my I was in my motor home in Halifax, the court in the middle of a monstrous, right in the middle of a hurricane, and it felt like I was on a boat. It, they're horrible, and to be out in the ocean when weather like that. So that's another one we keep open. You keep that open. And you know, my friends, as we read the spirit of prophecy, there's one big storm on the horizon. Do we not agree? There's a storm coming. You've got to keep that channel on, like on a boat, your Bible. And if you, if you read Brother Dan, where is he? I don't know, he's here somewhere. There he is. The other day when you walked up and you picked up the great controversy, that really touched my heart because I like to read that book. It is a wonderful book. And there are parts of the great controversy that we all should be reading right now. It's the latter day, the latter days, the troubles that we'll be in and how to prepare for them, especially in our hearts. Read it. I've read it over and over again, chapter and chapter, the latter days. I still wonder if I'm going to be ready. I'm going to conclude right now with two more nautical terms. And as I look around today, and in like many churches throughout North America today, there are empty pews. COVID has devastated a lot of people financially and spiritually. They have people missing since COVID. One of the expressions that is used, and it sounds nautical, and it was first coined, the phrase was coined in about the 1700s. It was called dire straits. It became very popular in the 1930s with Roosevelt when he was addressing the sad, sad state of North America, the Great Depression. And he often talked about dire straits. It's not a real place, but it's just to some people. Because what it means, it's a channel full of rocks, a place you don't want to be, dangerous. And I think right now, how many people right now are missing? And I hope they're watching on TV and they take note of this because some of them may have been blown in there by a bad wind. Bad wind, a, a, a depression, bad family news, illness. Some of them are that way. Some of them have ended up there because they never read the chart. And there's only one way of getting out that spiritual dire straits, and that is for each and every one, every day that we don't go there, is regular prayer, regular study. Study with all of your heart. There is another one. It's called Down in the Doldrums. I think you've all heard that. Yeah, the Doldrums is a real place. The Doldrums is, if you follow the equator around the world on the ocean, it's a place that you can drift into and 
There's no wind. Before you know it, you're stuck. You can't move. And sailors have been known to drift around in the doldrums for weeks or possibly months. There's no way out till you catch that breeze. There's a place like that just south of Texator Island. I often used to go over there and just jump overboard because there's no wind. Didn't go anywhere. But these people right now who are down in the doldrums, what you, and I hope you're listening to me right now on, on this TV, is that if you're down in the doldrums, you've still got to keep your sails up. You can't just lie there and wait for maybe somebody to come along because somewhere along that wind is going to pick up and you're out of there. Again, it's your, the Bible. That is your sails to get out of a situation like that. I was looking at scriptures at very, very early, last night late and early this morning, and one that I always come to is one of my favorites, and that is, we all know it, Psalm 119, 105. But I start at 104. It says, through your precepts, Precepts I get understanding, therefore I ha hate every false way. Your, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I love that scripture. And many years ago, I remember being asked, and I'll conclude with this, to do a sermon. And it was at the time where we, were, we had the Messiah's Mansion. That's gone back a few years now. It's a wonderful time. And I was doing security down there. And I had a sermon to do, either in Parksville or here, or I forget where it was. And I was working all day, and the only time I had a chance was to study was when I was on this security work at the Messiah's Mansion. But the light quit in my truck. The most amazing experience because the only place I could find a light working was in the holy place. And I was sitting there and studied each night. And I kept on thinking of that with the candles and the showbread, the curtains. And that really helped me through my life. But as I say, over these last few months, I have found such, such joy, so much help, because finally God has got it through to me. Study in all your sincerity. And that is my prayers for each and every one of you and everyone that's at home today. Get back into the Word of God. Start off small by studying your Sabbath school. Don't I, I've got to the point that I, I won't even. I, I turn this on. It used to be, oh, I'll check the football. I'll check the hockey. I have made a promise to my Lord God that none of that comes into my mind till I have read Scripture, prayers, and always read. Thankfully, it comes to me at 1.30 a.m. every morning from the Mrs. White's estate. And it is quotes from her. It's usually about a page long. I have made that my goal. This is not a burden because it has made my life more complete. And may that happen in your lives. Thank you.
please stand up. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Amen. Amen. Oh, Joe. 
me.